Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Sherwin-Williams ProQuest Business Training Series. Um, I'm your host, Christine Rich. I'm the Residential Repaint Marketing Director, and I'm joined with my fantastic co-host. Say hi, Julie. Hello, everyone. Julie Zamsky here, the Commercial Marketing Director at Sherwin-Williams. And we're really excited for today's episode. We are joined by Brandon Vaughn. He is the owner of Wise Coding, and he's also the owner um, and chief strategist for Conquer Coaching. And Brandon's going to talk with us today about ways to drive leads, quality leads with ease. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a couple housekeeping things. First and foremost, um, welcome. We're really glad you're all here. Please use the chat feature in Teams um, to comment, to ask questions. We want you to feel engaged. This is here for you to learn and grow. Um, we're pre-recording this first portion just because we want to make sure there's no technical difficulties. So after Brandon is done presenting, we're actually going to come back in live and answer um, all of your questions that are presented through the chat. If for any reason you would like to add some translations to the webinar today, you can actually um, do that by going to the three dots in the upper right hand corner of Teams and you can select more options and then select language and speech. After that, select turn on live captions and you can select your language. So if you prefer to get captions in Spanish, that's available for you as well. And um, with that, I'm going to kick it over to Brandon to introduce himself and to share all his great wisdom. All right. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Julie. Welcome, everyone. So great to have you here joining us today. And it's not lost on me that you've carved out some time of your busy schedule to come here and to learn a little bit more about how to get some marketing leads with ease, quality leads. Uh, so I want to make sure I bring as much value as humanly possible to you. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. I want to share my screen here and do a quick introduction of myself. So this is young Brandon right here. I've been in home services pretty much my entire life. I actually started working with my dad full time in his home service business at the age of 13, homeschooled through high school and went out on my own, started my own businesses. And this was me in 2012, starting an exterior cleaning company. Uh, over the course of the next four and a half, five years, grew that company from zero employees to over 70. I, at this point in time, I was working about five hours a week in the business and had my directors that would meet on a regular basis. I would just be checking in with them. Uh, but at this point, I was mostly semi-absentee. While I was kind of growing that business, I spoke a lot on different stages. I got invited to a lot of different industry associations, did these really silly Happy System Saturday social media videos, just kind of sharing tips that I learned along the way. I, I feel like I've made just about every single mistake that a business owner could make while growing a business. Uh, but one of the things I became most passionate about was marketing, which is why I'm especially excited to kind of share some of the things that we've learned. And not just the things that I've learned, but I actually founded a company called Conquer, we have over 40 certified Conquer coaches that all own and operate their own seven and eight figure home service business. And so we pulled them. What are some of the top things that you would suggest to small business owners just like you uh, to grow your business, to get those quality leads on autopilot? We've done some cool stuff. We've hosted some of the world's largest in-person mastermind meetings. This was called Conquer Live. We did this in 2019. We also have the Guinness World Record for the world's largest virtual business conference. 21,000 pros came and attended our event over four days. Uh, but I still also am a home service business owner as well. As Christine mentioned with Wise Coatings, I actually launched that business with a YouTube channel documenting 16 episodes, building that business from zero to $100,000 a month in four months. And actually now we're doing about $700,000 a month in 15 different locations. We're about ready to add another five or six. How do you know you're in the right place with me today? Well, if you're looking to find quality leads with ease, that's a good starting point. But also if you find yourself saying, I wanna grow my company, but maybe I struggle with getting jobs consistently. Is that you? Comment down below in chat. Do you struggle with getting jobs consistently? Does sometimes it feel like feast or famine? You got all this work coming in and then it dries up all of a sudden. Isn't that frustrating? Or maybe you're worried about a recession. This has been coming up a lot lately, especially among the pros and contractors and painters that I've been talking to in circles. We can feel it. We feel something might be happening. How can we find leads in any economy? 
Well, you're in the right place. This is what we're going to be diving in deep. So I'd encourage you turn off your distractions, your cell phones, put things on silent so that you can lock in and work on the business, not just in the business. This is classic on the business stuff here. How can we find ways to be able to bring work on autopilot without us having to work so hard for it? Uh, let's talk about recessions. You know, in 2007, that recession that we had there, a lot of you may or may not have gone through that yourself. It was tough, right? The economy went down 4.3%. Well, before that, we had the Great Depression. They couldn't even call it a recession. It was so bad, it was called the depression. The, the economy, the nation's GDP, went down 30% during that time period. But let's take a look at a quick case study among the auto industry during that time period. There was two major automakers during that time period and the correspondence of a whole bunch of other smaller automakers during this, this era that enjoyed about a third market share each. During the Great Depression, each of these businesses took two different approaches to handling this. One, automaker number one, decided to hibernate, to pull back their marketing spend, to pull out of radios and print magazines, while automaker number two, they went all in on marketing. They doubled down on their efforts. They changed their hooks, their messaging, and their offerings. During the Great Depression, automaker number two took more than 19% market share away from the other automakers and drove several out of business. But what's more impressive about this is that automaker number two was the only automaker to show a profit every year during the Great Depression. Isn't that epic? While the economy went down that far, they showed a profit. Why? Because they focused on marketing. Here's the illustration I like to use when I coach and when we coach home service business owners on creating marketing machines. I want you to imagine this machine a lot of, a lot of ways like a slot machine, right? You got a big lever on the side, you pull this big lever, you put in cash at the top, something comes out at the bottom. Hopefully, hopefully more cash, not, not nothing. But Imagine you had a machine where every time you put $1 in the top of it, $10 came out. How, how would you feel about that? Comment down in chat below. How would you feel about that type of machine? How fast would you be putting dollar coins or dollar bills into that machine on a regular basis, right? I mean, like you couldn't stop feeding it enough. This is what marketing is. And this is why it gets me so excited is that we can create this machine in your business to where we put $1 in and $10 comes out. What does that look like? Well, there's really three big secrets that we're going to talk about today to really dialing in your marketing efforts and strategies. And the first one that we're going to talk about is to be different. What does this mean? Well, let me ask you a question. What's different about you compared to your competition? If someone comes up to you and says, why should I pick you? What, what do you tell them? Well, I'll tell you what a lot of people tell customers. They say, hey, you know what? We're, we're a professional company. We're licensed, we're bonded, we're insured. Uh, I'm a member of my local chamber of commerce, member of the, you know, this association. I'm a local company and, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a nice guy or gal. That's, that's, that's what I am. Well, what's the problem with this? Guess what your competitors say? They say all the exact same stuff. And so when a consumer is comparing us, it feels like an apples to apples comparison. So when they get your quote and let's say it's $3,700 and your competitor comes in with $2,200, because you look so similar, they will immediately go to price. So in these scenarios, what's going to happen most of the time when we bid against these lower bidders? We're going to lose, right? Now, if we redo this and we focus instead on other aspects, let's say we focus on technology. In our company, we use an AI visualizer tool to actually show a customer what their new floor is going to look like. We focus on community, investing into our local communities as well as contributing to charity organizations. We actually adopt a baby elephant in the name of our customers for every floor that we do. We celebrate National Breast Cancer Awareness Month in a lot of different ways. And we get all of our technicians on board. We also are heavily involved with our community. What about eco-friendly? All of our products are zero VOCs. That's what we've decided and selected with our business. And we wanna make sure that we're eco-friendly and we're, and we're good stewards of our environment. Being instructor, 
you know, one of the reasons you saw some of those photos, a lot of the reasons why I really focused on being an instructor was we would use those pictures inside of our marketing materials to say, hey, our founder actually teaches the industry. I encourage you all to do the same. Being certified. There's certification process through amazing organizations like the Painting Contractors Association. What does your branding look like? Does that make you look different? Are you verified? Do you use third-party companies out there that verify criminal background screens and those license insurance bonding? When a consumer looks at two different companies that are like this, they're automatically going to assume that you have all those things on the right side. So this is going to be the winning side. They don't know how to compare the two of you because you're so different than your competitors. So when your bids come in, you're going to win. You're going to win more often than you lose because of it. And we know this is true because when we take a look at consumers, we can see in all these different other industries, consumers value experience. They value perceived value more than just actual tangible value of price. When someone says that your price isn't good enough, what they're saying is they don't perceive that your value is high enough to justify that price. I want to share a couple quick case examples of this. Over here on the left, we have Morton Steakhouse. When they bring the steaks out, maybe you've been to a steakhouse like this, you know, the, the, the waiter is sitting there talking about every single one of the, the different cuts of steak. They're educating you in the process. And then they bring out that Wagyu beef, right? They talk about how it's been massaged in butter and, and you know, milk and barley, and it's been massaged its entire life. And they build up all of this value, this perceived value. And then, of course, you have individuals like Salt Bay over here that has gold encrusted tomahawk steaks that sell for $800. And you've probably seen some of those videos of those people that will come in and they have this huge experience. When you order this thousand dollar steak, it's more than just a steak. It's an experience. It comes out with all this fanfare to where everyone's taking out their phones and they're recording it. Even with wines, they've taken cheap wines and done double blind taste studies and just the act of increasing, telling consumers that the price is four times more expensive than it actually is, consumers enjoy it more. They value experience. So when you think about differentiators and how to make you different from your competitors, think about what your customer experience is like, their journey in working with you in your business. I want to share a couple quick examples on this. And by the way, if you have some experiences that you use with your customers, comment down below. Let's share. Let's get everyone talking, sharing great ideas that other people can get and, and, and put in place in your business. So some of the things that we do is we utilize a company called GoDunzo, Dunzo.com or GoDunzo.com. And they design all of our postcards. We have everything automated to where the second that we give an estimate to a customer, they're getting postcards in the mail with their name on them. When we're finished with a the customer, they're getting a thank you card with a $100 gift card to give to one of their neighbors or, or somebody else, another referral, a place to scan the QR code. We give them brownies with their names printed on them. All this happens automatically. So that customer experience that they get, when they get brownies and a thank you card at the end of their job, they take pictures of it. They put it on social media. No one else does this in our area. And it makes a huge difference on just us being different as well. So as we have each one of these different stages of our, our estimate tracking process, we're able to automate all of these processes to where they just happen without us having to think about it, which creates that ultimate customer experience. We even roll out red carpet for our customers when we show them their project. We have these signs. By the way, this is one of the cheapest, best investments you could make. Go get a sign printed up. Have each one of your customers stand in front of their project holding the sign. They work phenomenally well for Facebook ads, all different kinds of areas. People love to see faces. It's fantastic social proof. It's such an amazing proof and testament of your experience when a customer is willing to say that they're 100% satisfied. So be different. Secret number one. Secret number two, math is the path. Now, one of the things I'm going to kind of dive into that is so comforting for me is that growing a service business is as easy as math and, and not complicated math, but third grade math. I'm talking multiplication and division. That's it. I promise you. Let's take a look at a couple KPIs and KPI stands for key performance indicator. Now, what that means is we have these different 
numbers that we can look at in our business, especially as it pertains to marketing, that tells us whether or not we're doing a good job. And I want to teach you a few right here. So I encourage you to write these down. You're going to want to make notes on this. And I want to describe each one of these one by one. So the first one we're going to talk about is cost per estimate. This is such a great KPI to know, especially when we're marketing on different platforms, such as Facebook, Google, Instagram, direct mail, right? We have these different platforms or these different channels where we're going to spend marketing dollars. We want to ultimately know how much is it costing us to get an estimate from that lead source. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at our monthly spend for, let's say, Google or Facebook. And we're going to divide that by the number of estimates that we got from that channel. That's going to give us our cost per estimate. Another number that we're going to be tracking is our closing ratio. If we get 100 estimates and we close 50 jobs, our closing ratio is 50%. Next, we're going to take a look at our average jobs. How big is our average job size? We're going to take a look at how many jobs we have in a period. We're going to divide it up by that revenue and get that good average job. That one should make you know pretty pretty good sense on that one. The next KPI we're going to look at is called customer acquisition cost. And this is a really amazing number that I want to show you how we can calculate this. This is basically what does it cost us on one of these marketing platforms to buy a customer? Now, this is what I'm at the end of the day. If there's nothing else you take away from this presentation, I want you to remember this CAC, C-A-C, Customer Acquisition Costs. When it comes to math, if you can know what your CAC is per each one of your different marketing channels, everything can change for you in your business. And I want to provide you some free resources that you can use to track this and calculate this automatically. And then the last, uh, the last KPI we're going to talk about is ROI, maybe something you've heard before. What's your return on investment? If I spend $100 on something and I get $1,000 back, just like that slot machine that we talked about, well, that's a 10 times return on my investment. That's a fantastic return. Okay, now let's put this to a practical application. Let's say we advertise on a platform, and I don't care what it is, if it's Angie, Home Advisor, Facebook, Google, uh, direct mail, TV, radio, we want to start being able to track how much we're, we're basically paying to give an estimate to someone who found us through that lead source. So let's say that's $100. If we're paying $100 to basically buy estimates from some of these different marketing channels, let's say we close at a 40% closing ratio. If we take $100 and we divide it by 0.4, which is 40% in a decimal format, 100 divided by 0.4, that's gonna give us $250 customer acquisition costs. So what this means is we can buy customers off of this platform for $250 each. Remember our average job size being $4,000? If you spent $250 for a new customer and they gave you $4,000, that's a 16 times return on your investment. That's pretty good, isn't it? Well, wouldn't we want a lot more of those? Absolutely, we would. This is what I mean by math is the path. It's so easy to reverse engineer whatever your goals are in your business. If you want to do a million dollars this year, we can take our average job size, we can divide that, and we could say, hey, you know what? That, that's only 250 jobs. That's all we got to do in a given year to do a million dollars. Maybe your average job size is higher. Maybe it's lower. You can adjust these numbers on your own. I know, I know you're taking notes and kind of going through this as we go along. But if we take a look at those jobs and we close 40% of the customers that we give estimates to, well, that's only 625 estimates that we have to give. So then it just becomes an exercise of going out and buying 625 estimates to be able to hit that million. So if we keep looking at this and expanding this example further and further, 250 jobs that we have to get to get that million, we pay $250 customer acquisition costs. We just have to spend $62,500 for the year in order to get that million dollars. That's just a little over 6%. And it doesn't matter if it's 1 million or 10 million. The numbers all work out. So here's the tracking sheet that I wanted to kind of have you work with and massage and enter in your own information. There's a spot here for you to enter in your monthly spends, 
how many leads you get from certain platforms, how many estimates you give, how many jobs, how much revenue you generated. And I want you to track this number every single month. You're gonna run this report every single month and it'll start giving you insights on how you can start to test, track, and tweak your numbers to dial it in a little bit more. And this is what we do. We go through and we adjust how our postcards look and the colors and the call to actions. We adjust our Facebook ads, we test them out. We're constantly trying to drive down our customer acquisition costs because at the end of the day, that's what marketing is, is going out and buying nice brand new shiny customers. And of course, when you have repeat business and referral businesses, that's even better. To me, that's almost kind of like bonus revenue, but we'll talk a little bit more about how we can leverage that here in our third secret. So do you have stamina? Of course you do. You're a business owner. You're an entrepreneur. You decided you would jump off a cliff and, and build the plane on the way down. You, you do. You're one of the crazy entrepreneurs that decided to do this crazy journey. I know that you have it within you. It's just a matter of testing, tracking, and tweaking. Testing out different hooks, offers, different channels, tracking the results with that tracking spreadsheet, and then tweaking it each month to be able to optimize it. Our third secret we're going to talk about is bog marketing or boots on the ground marketing. Now, what does that mean? Well, this is marketing that doesn't necessarily cost a whole lot of money, but it costs a little bit more of our time and a little bit more of our intentional effort. This is a fantastic way to bring work into our business without spending a lot of dollars. This means going and knocking on doors. We've all had to probably do it at one point in our life. Cold calling, flyering, canvassing, relationship building. All of these things are critical to be able to grow a business and they're a good resource, a good marketing avenue to be able to keep your marketing expenses lower and kind of optimize those marketing expenses. So when you start looking at some of these marketing avenues, cold calling, flyering, canvassing, I wanna focus on one that's relationship building. Think about all the other businesses that are complementary to yours. Garage floor coatings, perhaps, garage door installs, siding companies, roofing companies, window companies, exteriors, individuals that might do pressure washing and cleaning, even carpet cleaners, plumbers, electricians, HVAC businesses, landscapers, pest control, all these other home service businesses, they have a similar customer data set as you. If someone's paying to get painting, they're probably paying to get their gutters cleaned, their roof cleaned, their carpets cleaned. Well, are we reaching out to other businesses in our area to start building up relationships and maybe even make our own little networking group? This is one of the best ROI marketing pieces that I've ever created. We created these called Best of Portland. We made it up, by the way. And what we would do is we would get seven other businesses that were complementary to ours, and we would add them on this sheet. I removed them just to protect their information. So we have a bunch of my company here. But we'd go ahead and create these, and we'd have we'd print out 100,000 of these, divide them up by eight, and each one of the businesses on every service call that they would do, they would hand deliver it to a customer and say, hey, we're part of the best of Portland list. Wanted to let you know, hey, if you need a, a painter, if you need a cleaner, an HVAC, and we would give these out hand delivered, and it was one of the best return on investments we've ever had because it's literally just the cost of printing these out. You're hand delivering these to, to customers at the end of each service. Uh, amazing platform. So uh, another low hanging fruit when it comes to boots on the ground marketing is making sure that you're leveraging your existing customers. This is where your lowest hanging fruit is when it comes to customers sending them email blasts, sending them text blasts. You can even do something called a ringless voicemail where you can drop a pre-recorded voicemail into all of your customers' database or, or kind of identify which ones purchased from you a year ago, two years ago, and just check in and see if they need any other spaces taken care of. Sending them mail, flyers, postcards, going out and putting yard signs out, putting door hangers out to all of the neighbors of every single one of your jobs that you do. Don't forget about your existing customers and know that there's gold in those hills. You just got to go and you have to work it and you have to mine it and extract it out. And then lastly, what we're going to talk about when it comes to boots on the ground is leveraging memberships. Some of the best return on investments we've had has been joining our local chamber of commerce. 
They have weekly meetings. Most chambers have weekly meetings. Attend them. Go show up to them. Don't just rent the logo of associations. Go and network and talk to the individuals that are there and tell them about your company and learn what about their company and build up those relationships. BNI is another one that's another organization that you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, it's a pay to play type of organization, very similar to Chamber of Commerce, but you can be a part of a small little networking group that is required to attend meetings and network with each other. Even going and belonging to some of your local commercial associations or multifamily associations, the National Apartment Association has chapters all over the United States, and you can join those chapters and you can go to some of their trade shows and we'll have 1,200 to 1,600 property managers walking around the trade show floor. And we've attended some of these multifamily trade shows and have left with about 70 estimate requests and about 450 leads and there's a, a whole hour long presentation I could talk to just specifically about multifamily and commercial associations, but check out organizations like IRAM, BOMA, CAI, all of these associations you can attend, go to these different regular network meetings, get involved with them and start building those relationships with those individuals. Uh, same thing with trade associations, other painting organizations, get involved with your local chapter of PCA and network with others. All right, so I know we've covered a lot. I've gone through this quickly. I wanted to be able to give as much information I could to you in a shorter period of time, but I have a question for you. Will you execute on what you've learned? I, I, believe me, I'm the same way. I'll, I'll come to a webinar, I'll be really hyped up about it, I'll be taking lots of notes, and then the next day comes and the fires come up in our business and then we forget. I wanna encourage you, go onto your calendar right now and block out some times on your calendar for this week or next week but when you're gonna actually execute and get this done. Don't lie to yourself, don't lack in execution. There's been studies done by the American Society of Training and Development where individuals are 40 to 95% more likely to achieve your goals just by writing them down, committing to someone else that you're going to do them, and then actually having that person hold you accountable with a deadline and a timeline. So if you wanna execute and get these things done, I highly encourage you to have someone hold you accountable to getting this done. By the way, this is something that we do often in our Conquer programs. Uh, we have hundreds, thousands of Conquer members that are all working on their business. It's exclusively for home service businesses. If you're interested in learning more, I'd encourage you to check out what we have going on inside of our community. We offer lots of different coaching programs and accountability programs. If you're looking for that sense of community where you can talk to about some of these ideas, uh, I'd encourage you to check it out. Our average Conqueror grows 77% year over year. Here's, of course, a couple testimonials if you want to take a look at that. But I'd encourage you, this is where you could go to learn a little bit more, bit.ly slash conquer fit. It'll take you to a calendar of one of our good fit specialists, and we can talk to you a little bit more about that offline. But next, I'd like to open it up to you all. Let's get some Q&A. Let's get Christine and Julie back on here, and let's open up and see how we can customize this presentation specifically to you. Hi, everybody. Um Brandon, it's so good to see you. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Yeah, Julie, how's it going? I think Julie might be on mute. How about no. now? Can you hear me now? There you are. There, there we are. It wouldn't be a webinar without a few little technical difficulties. So, <laughs> um, Brandon, I want to just first of all, thank you. Um, your presentation has been absolutely amazing. Um, we always do the pre-recording, as, as you know, just in case we do have technical difficulties and, and watching it back, there is just such great content. So we're excited to have you here for the live Q&A. Um, if folks who are still listening, if you can please use the chat feature, um, you'll see chat across the top of your screen. If you click on that, you can write in your questions for Brandon. Um, Julie or myself. In the meantime, we did have one question come through already. So um, one of the questions was, do you include indirect costs on your um, CPE um, or only the direct costs? Ooh, that's Any a great... of the analysis you do. So yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, indirect costs and direct cost costs are a little bit more associated to COGS, you know, cost of goods sold and, and gross margin. So when it comes to your marketing, what you want to kind of combine as your cost uh, per estimate is your media ad spends and any additional management fees that you may be paying to a marketing company. So if you're paying, 
you know, 600 bucks a month for a Google ad management company to manage your Google ad spend. And then you're spending an extra $2,400 a month in Google ad spend. Like that total amount that you're spending on Google is 3000. Then you take how many estimates you have. Let's say you have, you know, 30 estimates, hopefully more than that from $3,000. Let's say you have 30 estimates, then your cost per estimate would be about a hundred. So it's, it's really linear how many estimates you have, how much your total spending is during that monthly period, and then that'll get you that cost per estimate. Thank you. Uh, Julie, I think we have another question. Do you want to take this one yep. from Trina? Yep, we've had a few come through. Actually, there's one above it. So oh, I will address the first one. Um, the question is, what makes your flyer stand out? It's actually a two-part question. And he said, what's the customer attention span on your marketing? Maybe three seconds? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they did a study on Facebook where they said that the average, it used to be the average attention span of a human was four seconds on Facebook, which is less than that of a goldfish. They they now say that it's only about two and a half seconds. So when it, there's two different you know places where we can put our marketing when you have interruption marketing like Facebook, you have to have that hook that grabs your attention very, very quickly. I've seen a lot of people on their Facebook ads, they have their videos up there and like the first five seconds is this really cool animated logo that they have on Fiverr, you know, their company and it looks kind of cool. Customers don't care. Like you need to like grab their attention really quickly. So that hook that you have in the digital media side has to, uh, my, my formula for it is, call out your your target audience first by name whether in captions or or directly so like west lynn homeowners if you're looking for a painting you know a contractor here's why you know it's like it's quick it's to the point it kind of grabs their attention because they hear themselves so that's for like uh digital media and then when it comes to print media your attention span of course is is still very very short because if, if they're getting postcards in the mail they're kind of doing this as their filter you know scanning through their cards and then putting it into their sorting bin also known as the garbage can and they're going through it real fast so you have to have some kind of a hook or image that really grabs their attention and your return on your investment is going to drastically change depending on how quickly you capture their attention you have a real clear call to action and a good offer that makes them get FOMO, fear of missing out. Like crap, if I don't if I don't take care of this right now, then I'm going to totally miss out on this. So those elements on your marketing campaigns are are really important to get a good response. That's that's great advice, Brandon. Um, now we're going to go to Trina's question. So how do folks get the diagrams that you showed? So by diagrams, um, which one specifically are you talking about? Because we have uh, one of those template files that has uh, those. And, you know, Christine, you'd have to kind of tell me if there's a way that we can kind of get those out to people, um, yeah. you know, as far as that file itself goes. But certainly willing to share, you know, anything that I've shared on, on this presentation with you guys. Are you able to, I don't know if you can now, if not, we'll make sure that we find a way to get it to everybody here. Um, if you're able to link it in the chat, if not, um, and Julie and I talked about this in the chat before, we always put every single webinar episode on Sherwin Williams um, YouTube channel. And so if we can't link it here, we will definitely link it in the show notes. It usually takes a couple of days to come through. So um, we will make sure we get those to everybody. Um, and um, we'll even see if we can just push them out via email too. So uh, great question, Trina. And yeah, then sounds we have a good. question. Yeah, from Jess. Awesome. So another question came through um, and it's, what do you recommend for follow-up techniques? I have a few quotes sent out and so far no response. Ooh, I love this. This is an awesome question. <laughs> so I, I subscribe to something called give, 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 ask. Uh, Gary V calls it jab, 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 right hook. And so the, you know, my formula is I want to give value to customers three times more than I'm asking them for something. So in my follow-up sequences, if I give an estimate to someone, the very next follow-up email and text blast that I'll do will be, uh, Hey, Christine, I forgot to give this to you while I was at your house yesterday. This is our best of, or I'm sorry, this is our home maintenance checklist that we give all of our home, our, our clients. It has a list of all the different maintenance items you should do on your home. It's a pure value add. And I don't ask anything at that point. I just like, here, here this is, I just forgot to give this to you. 
And then the next follow-up sequence I'll do will be like, hey, I saw this really cool article on HGTV talking about garage organization tips. And it made me think of you. And so I wanted to do this. Like, I want to compel my customers to reply back, wow, thank you. If you follow, if your follow-up sequences are like, hey, have you decided yet? Hey, do you want to buy yet? Hey, um, you know, just checking <laughs> to see if you're still interested. I'm just following up. Like, that's some of the worst follow-ups you, you can possibly do. You want to make sure that you're engaging them in a question and never, ever, ever have your follow-up say like, if there's anything you need, just let me know. Because that call to action isn't strong enough where someone's going to feel compelled to reply back. So I like to end all of my follow-ups with a direct question where it feels uncomfortable not to, not to, you know, to, to, to get an answer back. Like the client will be like putting their fingers down. Like I must reply to this email because you know, it's, it, it feels weird if you don't, it feels like you're, you know, someone asks you a question, you're like rude on the street and you don't answer them. So uh, make sure that you give more value than you ask. And, and, and lastly, don't ever stop. So like with Dunzo, one of the things that they've built out, by the way, they built all those sequences for us. One of the things that uh, we do is we also put them into a 12 month nurture sequence. So after we hammer them a whole bunch of times, there's logic that if they've answered, it stops the automations. Otherwise it just keeps going and going and going. And we've had people reply six months later, like, man, I'm so glad that you reached out to me. We just got busy. I definitely want to get this done. And you know, what would happen if you didn't, you know, maybe they forgot and then maybe they go and just like, I can't remember the name of that company. And then they go online and they find someone else. So just never stop following up either. I think that's such great advice, Brandon. And, and, and two kind of real world examples. Someone had asked me about um, a company and I couldn't, there's like, I can't find the sales rep's name. Do you have it? I looked through every presentation this company sent me two years prior and there was not one human's name on it and no way to contact them. And I thought, man, that is a miss for them because now I, I don't have the contact. So like, you know, personalizing, putting your name and like simple things like that are so important. I will also say another great tip for following up is in the Sherwin-Williams Pro Plus app, we have something called a Pro Color Toolkit. This is my favorite tip. Um, homeowner's number one pain point is choosing color. It, it's what it's what stalls jobs. It's what causes frustration. If you have an estimate out there and you're waiting to hear back from a homeowner, um, to Brandon's point, instead of saying, "Hey, are you ready to start that job?" You can send them within the Pro Color Toolkit on Sherwin Williams um, Pro Plus app one of three text messages that are already written for you. Literally, all you have to do is hit send. You can say, I was thinking about you, not sure if you're stuck on color. Here are the top 50 colors that are most popular with Sherwin-Williams if you want to take a look. Um, did you know Sherwin-Williams has a free virtual color consultation? Um, if you're interested or kind of stuck, here's another great resource for you. And then the third one is a resource for them to order peel and stick or chips online. So again, it's not a hard sell. It's just a, hey, I was thinking of you. I know color can be tricky. Here's some resources in case you need help. So I think that's another great tip that, again, doesn't cost anything but your time. So good, Christine. That's awesome. Y'all better wrote that down. That's gold right there. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Oh, we have a really juicy I, question from Mike. We've got, it's, yeah, quite a few coming through. Okay, All right, oh, let's go. I'll okay, try to keep my see. answers shorter so we can get a bunch Jess's more. <laughs> yet. I was going to go ahead and ask Jess's. If you okay, go ask Jess. Work. Yep, ask Jess's. Yep. Um, Jess asked, I am not able to run Facebook or Google ads because of my website. My business model is laid out there and I'm not willing to change my business model and not willing to change the website. What would be the third or second or third best option for me to pursue as far as marketing? Well, to get somewhere you've never been means doing things you've never done. So the first thing I want to encourage you is maybe the answer is doing something that feels uncomfortable, but it actually is the right thing for your business to do. Uh, I don't know all the context behind why you can't or why you won't change your website. Maybe there's some history there, but uh, you can run Facebook ads and Google ads uh, with a management company that can help you build landing pages and you can direct traffic from those ads to landing pages. So, you know, I, I, again, this is a very interesting question to me and there's probably a lot of context that we could unpack there. Uh, but most often getting, you don't want to direct Facebook ads to your website always because people can kind of get lost on there and then they bounce. But having like a landing page where they go from Facebook ads or Google ads to a landing page where they can't do anything else, they can't click on any other things except for 
request an estimate. Uh, sometimes that funnels people in a little bit better to where you'll see higher conversion rates. So it's not necessarily a deal breaker, but you definitely are probably going to have to enlist the help of a professional to help you manage and set up some of those things. It's very difficult to DIY it, and I don't recommend DIYing that type of stuff. Um, I will say we have a great episode on Marketing 101 uh, with a um, gentleman from Basecoat, Austin, and he talks a lot mm -hmm. about this. So go back and watch that on our um, YouTube channel just to give you some more tips maybe would help Jess. Um, Alexander Jones asks, do coupons on flyers work? And I feel like the marketing answer is going to be, it depends. So I will let you take that one, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? It depends. <laughs> I'd say that it's uh, it, the the offer really matters. So uh, some things that I've kind of learned when it comes to coupons, uh, percentages off don't convert as well as dollar amounts off. There's some psychology behind that because if you say, you know, hey, 10% off, okay, 10 is a tiny little number. If you say 500 bucks off, wow, that sounds a little bit more compelling. They still might mean the exact same thing, but what may a customer resound with a little bit more? 10% is very, very vague. It doesn't give you much. Uh, whereas that coupon can feel a little bit more valuable. One of the things that we do is we actually have gift cards that um, you know that that we've printed out that look they have they even have a fake chip printed on them, and it looks like a like an actual credit card. On the back of them, there's like a fake magnetic stripe, and then where the little CVC code would go on the spot where you'd sign it, uh, those are actually tracking numbers where we can track who we gave those gift cards out. Um, and, and we find that people convert with those a lot better because they don't want to throw it away. It feels like a real credit card. So there's a lot that kind of goes into the, to the design of coupons, uh, what colors you can use, what your copy and your text kind of does to get people to to really feel like there's some FOMO there. Um, can I, I'll share a real quick story. One of the best Final emails, or I'm sorry, uh, emails that I'll send out to people is let them know that there's a credit that's about to expire on their account. And people freak out and they like, they they like, we're like, what credit are we talking about? Oh yeah, we had, we, we gave you a $500 credit on your account that would go towards your painting services, but it's about ready to expire. And people, you know, they, they panic over that type of thing. So like anything that you can do to kind of build out FOMO, fear of missing out and, and get people to act fast will help you kind of drive those results. So coupons on flyers, absolutely they work. Absolutely they do, if you do them properly. Yeah. I always say don't make people do math. Percentage off makes requires people to do math. Like don't make people do math. <laughs> Just yeah. let them know what they're going to save. So I love that. Sure. Julie, you want to hit the next one? Yes, I think I'm a little further down, so you may have to jump back. But um, <laughs> I was responding to some of the, the things in the chat. You know, you guys are awesome. I love yeah, the Great questions. Activity. Yes. Um, Theodora asks, do you have any online site suggestions for marketing that are free or low fee until we can build up a budget for better ROI marketing strategies? Yes. Go into Facebook groups, go into Facebook yeah. groups, look in your local areas and join Facebook groups. Be someone there that, that, that adds value to the group. Uh, you can, add, there's actually software out there that'll, that'll allow you to monitor keywords on posts that happen inside of Facebook groups. So you can get notified when people ask, Hey, does anyone know a painting company? Hey, I'm looking to paint my house and you can add like paint as a keyword and trigger. So you get a notification and you can go and you, you can subscribe to, you know, five, six, seven, a dozen different Facebook groups that, that may like serve your local area, uh, and find out what the posting rules are. Some moderators are a little bit, you know. Uh, they're a little bit more difficult to to work with than other moderators, but that's something where you can go in and start kind of getting some traction uh, on some of those sites online. Uh, another big important thing is get your name on every free listing site that you can. So do you have a presence? Do you have your Yelp account built out all the way? Because you can build it out and add images and galleries and stuff for free. You don't have to necessarily advertise on there. Um, make sure that your customers are leaving you five-star reviews, not only on Google, but ask your customers, hey, do you, do you have a Yelp account? Would you mind going and leaving us a Yelp review? You know, just get your, bump up your reviews on different platforms. You know, that kind of helps you spread across. And there's really cool little platforms out there that'll do, they're called listing aggregator 
uh, sites. And what they'll do is they'll post your business listings on like 500 different business listings and you only pay a few hundred bucks to get that done. Uh, so there's, there's different tips and tricks on the free side for media. Most of it kind of involves getting into some communities online where people are talking and chatting and just making yourself the expert, all things home services. That's such great advice. Um, so we have, I'm going to go back to Mike because we did skip over him. Um, he says, my first ad goes out next week. The cost of the one region I chose is $539. Uh-oh, you might have to do math, Brandon. The amount of um, customers that receive it is $35,000. i am waiting to see how it pays off before I go into another region. My math tells me that if only 1% of readers are looking for painters, that's a 350 estimates. The magazine is called Clipper Magazine. My question oh. is, with these type of numbers, am I correct in thinking it should pay off? Also, my different, better than the rest, uh, collar grab is owner on every job site to give your projects that special, special attention um, to detail that they deserve. Okay. So um, I'll provide two points of feedback. 1% uh, conversion is amazing it would be like wow you just hit the jackpot if you spent 500 and some bucks and you got 350 estimates totally not realistic of an expectation um i would be thrilled and i'm not even exaggerating with this i would be thrilled if i got like 10 to 20 estimates from this so i, I think you should kind of adjust your expectations in that area you are not going to get 350 I, i'd be willing to bet you how much you paid on that if you did get 350 you're not getting anywhere close it'll be a fraction of a percent clipper magazine also sometimes can tend to attract in a little bit lower end of a demographic as opposed to a little more middle end, high end. So you might get smaller tickets on some of your jobs. You might notice that your closing ratio is way worse with Clipper than with some other home mags that might be a little bit more high end, a little you know, more uh, you know, specific in neighborhoods. And then the second thing that I'd say is, you know, the the owner operator, the owner comes up and they and they do that. I'll just give you a little side extra bonus coaching. Let's try to find you some different differentiators. Because if you want to scale your company and grow, you will be the bottleneck to how many estimates you can fit in and kind of do yourself personally. And I think that there's some better different hooks that you can use as your competitive differentiator that's not dependent on you. Because if you get sick, if something happens to you personally, if you go on vacation, your competitive differentiator goes out the, the window. Or when you start growing, you're gonna need to hire a salesperson and that's not gonna you know matter anymore. So start proactively thinking about what are some other competitive differentiators that, that homeowners really care about? Because let me also say that homeowners don't always love the fact that it's an owner operator because it could be very difficult to track that owner operator down. And they may have had bad experience in the past with dealing with a solo operator and I can never get him on the phone. He's always running his machine or he's on the road or he's doing this. So that's that's not always a positive thing uh, for, for some homeowners. Great answer. Answer. Great question. I love you asking those questions. I know. Really, really good. The activity is great today. Um, so the next one that popped out here, all of uh, out of all of the CRMs out there, why did you pick Gusto? Well, so Gusto is not a CRM. Gusto is an HR management platform that helps with payroll. So you'll use Gusto to do your payroll processing, to do time tracking with your employees, do benefits enrollments, register your employees, you know, onboard them, et cetera. Uh, so that the the CRM that I use is House Call Pro. And there's several different CRMs that are out there. There's Service Titan, there's House Call Pro, there's, you know, Paint Scout, I think is even like a, is Paint Scout a CRM? Um, yeah, so there, there's, there's just different, there's different CRMs that are, that are out there and, and we use house call pro. The main reason why I use them is because uh, they're, they're pretty mobile friendly. They have 2000 employees and they're developing things at a rapid, rapid rate. So they're always launching new features. Uh, so the support for it is pretty high. Um, Jess asks, do you think paying lawn sign fines is worth it in areas that don't allow them? 
or <laughs> with the fact that you are willing to ignore the bylaw and just pay the fine to turn uh -huh. potential customers in the long run. I don't know if we can answer this right now on the next episode. So we definitely don't want to condone anyone doing anything yeah, against, not, against I, the law. I, I will say don't, don't place any signs in areas where you shouldn't place them. Um, I will say that. Uh, what I do is I ask permission for, for our homeowners if we can uh, leave them outside. Um, and, and they'll they'll let us know if there's issues al along those uh, lines. So, yeah, I, I don't don't pay fines. Don't do things illegal. We had another one come in from Roy Miller Painting. Where is the best place to advertise for ultra high end clients? Ooh, let's see. Ultra high end. So, ask yourself where do these ultra high end homeowners hang out? What are, what are they doing for fun? Um, I, I went to one of our customers' house. They they were like every single day going to their tennis club. And I asked them very point blank, you know, hey, wh what do you guys do for fun? What are your hobbies? Like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, we belong to this wine club. We belong to this tennis club. You know, we have this, you know, cigar club, the, the all these different places. And so I just asked them, you know, hey, if I could find more, where should I go to find more customers like you? I love you so much. I love working with you so much. How can I find more people that are, that are like you? You'd be amazed at how many introductions and connections you can kind of find just from asking that one simple question. Uh, we found neighborhood magazines being a really good one in certain areas specifically, and then also a direct targeted mail. So you can pull lists based upon demographics of home values, median income, and you can actually send direct customized targeted mail to them and never just send one postcard, always send like a sequence of at least three to the same home. Uh, so kind of factor that in when you're looking at kind of budgeting for that. Uh, and, and that can be a good way to kind of get in front of those people as well. Uh, other methods of targeting, they're not as reliable, but those ones where you're targeting their addresses specifically are a little bit more reliable. Yeah, I would say too, you know, there's not, it's very rare that something is a is a quick fix. So I think being consistent and like you said, trying a lot of things and tweaking, um, there's always the short game and the long game. So what are your thoughts on that question specifically around networking with residential designers, like high-end residential designers? Oh yeah, absolutely, Christine. Good call out. Yeah, that's that's a that's a massive one. You know, if you if you have homeowners that are going in and they're you know hi hiring these painting consultants, design consultants to come in, and you can get in with those, they'll they'll have a, a nonstop list. And usually they'll ask for some kind of a kickback or a finder's fee, or you know subcontract you into the price. But if you can build those relationships, the homeowner almost always says yes <laughs> to to, yeah. to that type yeah. of a that type of relationship. Yeah, I would say tapping into uh, realtors in your area as well. So again, certain realtors tend to uh, list certain price homes. And so tapping and networking with those two, I think is really important. You know, you talked about community and I think that those are some other things to think about too. Um, yeah. Just just ask, what is a fair finder's fee? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> it, it, it depends. I'd say that if it, what what we typically do is uh, we'll we'll pay out like, you know, if, if you look at your customer acquisition costs, this is kind of why it's good to find your customer acquisition costs. If you didn't have to pay for the marketing and maybe you did or you didn't have to pay sales commission on that job because they already teed it up for you and even sold it for you, well, I'd pay a lot higher of a percentage, but it wouldn't exceed my max customer acquisition cost that I'm targeting plus my sales commission that I might pay a salesperson. So that, you know, if I pay a salesperson 10%, and then we have a customer acquisition cost, you know, and someone brought me a sold job, I'd pay them that 10%. Uh, but I'm, I'm very cautious at making sure the math still checks out for uh, compared against my marketing efforts. Great point of that's where really knowing your numbers kind of comes in. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. We have two more minutes left and I would love uh, a few more questions for Brandon or for Julie or myself. Um, while we see if there's any last minute questions, I'm gonna ask you one more time, Brandon, what are some things that folks can do today, this week, um, to really set themselves up for success? And where can people find you if they want more of your great wisdom? <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, first thing to do is I want you to put one hour on your calendar and block it out, time block it, to just sit down and start doing a little bit of math. Go into your QuickBooks, see how much you're spending on things, go into your CRM. If you have paper napkins or whatever paper calendar system you use, uh, start doing some basic math and just seeing 
how much am I paying for a customer? How much am I paying for an estimate? Uh, it'll be a very eye-opening exercise, and you may realize what to do next just from that one exercise alone. So just start getting comfortable with it, and then set a recurring appointment every single month to do the exact same thing. Uh, for those who are looking to connect with me, you can hit me up on Facebook. I use Facebook only for business, so you won't it won't be weird you connecting with me there. Uh, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. And, you know, again, if, if Conquer seems like something that might be interesting to you, we actually have 40 plus certified coaches that work with our clients one on one and in small groups. Uh, so go.conquernow.com can be a place where you can go and uh, apply and see if your business might be a good fit for that. Um, will higher prices give you the differentiation of perceived value on their own? I would say no. You higher prices i've lost jobs because i was too cheap and customers are are like man you're the cheapest one out of all these ones that i got something must be wrong uh, and, and that can happen i've seen people un underprice themselves to the point where a consumer will distrust what the, what's the change order what's the gotcha what's the catch and people you know can't understand that so make sure that your prices are high but still have your perceived value be very high as well so we send pictures of our technicians before they show up, pictures of our salespeople before they show up with proof of their criminal background screen, our presentation folders, our videos, our email, our communication, our text follow-ups. We actually text the customer a link when our salespeople, salesperson hits on my way and it'll show an Uber style app with their car driving to their house and they can click the link and they can like watch the car come and show up. Uh, we so use that satisfying. It's amazing. And the customer's are like, I've never seen that. That is so cool. I hate waiting around for contractors and I got to see like an ETA and like, it's this tiny little thing, but all of a sudden the perceived value skyrockets, uh, your wraps, like you want to pull up into the house and people say, oh, okay, these are going to be the expensive guys. I already know it. You know, and you, you kind of give that vibe. And then the sales process is unbelievably critical to building up perceived value. So, you know, demos and showing scratch resistant, like have, you know, get some of your killer Sherwin-Williams paints and put them on sample boards and have them scratch them with a quarter and put fingerprints on them, like demo it, get people involved in the process. That's perceived value, right? Yeah, have you seen those, the, the walls that get all chalky and dusty when you put your fingers on it? Check this out, feel this out. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, this is amazing. That's why we only use Sherwin-William products. So anything that you can do to build that educational process in and make a customer feel like even if they don't pick you, they learn something, that's how you know that you're getting good perceived value. And you'll stand out, I guarantee you. So yeah, 100%. I think this is such great conversation, Brandon. We definitely have to have you back on the webinar. I feel like you might need to be a reoccurring guest. Oh, I um, love it. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, Chris Lawson, last comment we'll make is that yes, a copy of this recording is going to be on Sherwin Williams YouTube channel. Um, give us a day or two. We need to make um, you know a couple quick uh, edits, and then we'll upload it. We'll make sure we get some great resources from Brandon um, and link those in the show notes. And um, in the meantime, follow us on uh, Facebook. Sign up for our Pro Plus app. There's so many great resources in our app. Um, lots of lots of value added resources. And um, join us next time. And on November 15th, we're going to be talking about social media 101. It's going to be a great conversation. Remember to also um, take the survey, please. If you scroll up, I'll put it in here one more time. Um, Oops, that's not it. Um, if you scroll up, you'll see uh, our QR code and then a link to a survey. We wanna make sure that our pros are getting as much value as is possible. So um, with that, we will see you all next month. Thank you so much, Brandon. Thank you, Julie. And um, enjoy the rest of your week. Bye guys. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you.